Hey guys, it's Chris, and welcome back to another Game of Thrones Season 7 review video. One of my favorite episodes of the entire season so far, I think because we had a lot of callbacks, a lot of loose ends tied up as far as some of the dialogue scenes in previous seasons. So let's jump right into it. Episode 3, The Queen's Justice. <laughs> Scene we have John arriving at Dragonstone and meets Daenerys Targaryen for the first time, and I believe this scene was done very, very well. First of all, he pulls up at the beach, he meets Tyrion, and they use callback lines from season one, episode two, The King's Road, the last time John and Tyrion saw each other, and he says, The Bastard of Winterfell, John says, The Dwarf of Castle Rock. So I'm loving how already in this episode they're using these callback lines and wrapping up a lot of loose ends as far as some of these subplots and side stories and a lot of RLJ Rhaegar Targaryen teases as well during this episode. But I thought that was an outstanding scene on the beach with Tyrion and John kind of meeting up for the first time in a long, long time. And of course, John added the little line, it looked like you picked up a lot of scars along the way. So I look forward to them catching up a bit more. And we did see a little bit more later on in the episode. I really love the dialogue on the way up to the actual castle itself as it walked all those damn stairs. And yes, this place needs fucking escalators, like I said before. But Tyrion brought up Sansa, how she was doing, because they were in fact married, although it wasn't consummated. Tyrion made sure John knew that. And she said she's smarter than she lets on. And John said, yeah, she's starting to let on. But one of my favorite scenes of the episode was also during this walk up to the castle when Tyrion reminds Jon it's generally not a good rule of thumb for Starks to head south. They don't fare well because, of course, that's referring to history as far as Rob being killed going south, Ned being killed going south, and going even further back as far as Rickard Stark and Brandon Stark being killed by the Mad King, Danny's father. He says, yeah, true, but I'm not a Stark. But as soon as he said this, a dragon comes flying by, and I think it was Drogon, but I'm fucking colorblind. Jon and Davos hit the fucking deck like, oh shit, what the hell was that? And it's pretty damn cool to see because actually you think about it, they've heard about dragons, a lot of people have heard about dragons, but once you see a full grown dragon for the first time, how the hell would you react? And then he finally gets to the throne room and I thought this was a pretty great exchange overall. You know, Danny had 47 titles, John had just one, Jon Snow, King of the North, and I thought that was pretty good to have a little comedic relief in there as well. He didn't really know what to say, like him and Davos hadn't really planned out what to say. Danny was trying to be a little bit more formal and regal and probably trying to intimidate John a little bit, but he wasn't having none of it. And I really like the callbacks to history here as well. I love how Danny brought up the last King of the North, Torin Stark, who was actually known as the King who knelt in the books. He was the one who was the last King of Winter who bent the knee to Aegon the Conqueror in order to save his people. And in turn, he was named first Lord of Winterfell and Warden of the North and got to keep his ancestral sword ice. I also gotta say, I really loved how Danny formally apologized for what her father did, the Mad King, as far as killing Ricard Stark and Brandon Stark, John's grandfather and uncle, since Lyanna is his mother. That's technically still true, but I really think in this whole scene, they really respected each other. They kind of understood that they were coming from the same place, although they had different stories. Danny had been through a lot of shit to get where she is. John had been through a lot of shit and actually died to get where he is. And as a matter of fact, Davos was talking about John, about what he's done and why he became Lord Commander, why he became King of the North and all that in the first place. And John actually stopped him from completing the sentence about him actually giving his life for the people that elected him in those leadership positions. So I think they'll save that for a little bit later. He'll kind of keep that close to his chest pun intended. And of course, Danny picked up on that as far as taking a knife to the heart, and she brought it up again later to Tyrion. We had our fair share of little Targaryen hints. As I said, we got a lot of little teases this episode as far as Jon being a Targaryen. First with the dragon flying over right when he says, I'm not a Stark. And second of all, when Danny says, I am the last Targaryen, I was sitting there saying, no, no you're not. And it's going to be a big ass shocker when they find out who he actually is. But overall, this is a really well done scene. I really love the theme here again. It kind of continued the theme from the previous episodes as far as do not blame the children for the sins of the father that went for the Mad King and Danny. And from Danny's perspective, that also goes for Jon Snow being the son of Ned Stark, as far as she knows, and as far as everybody else knows for that matter, because he was, in fact, in league with Robert to overthrow her father and get him killed and kicked off the Iron Throne because he was crazy. So from both of their perspectives, they had to kind of forgive each other for the sins of their father. And during the scene, we had Melisandre up on the hill here with Varys. And this was a very odd scene. She was out there basically hiding out because she wasn't on good terms with Jon, of course, because of Davos and the whole Shireen situation. And another line I thought was really cool for this episode when Varys was talking to Melisandre was, she actually said, my job is done here. I brought together ice and fire. But technically that's not true. 
true because John is both. So we talked about that in a little bit in Dragon Raised by Wolves. The Night King is ice and Danny is fire. Jon Snow is both. So that just kind of shows you that technically she's still wrong. She really doesn't know how important John is. She knows he's important. She knows he's somebody important because of obviously he came back to life and she believes that was due to the power of the Red God R'hllor, but she really doesn't know who John is, although she does apparently sense that Valyrian blood, but don't really know exactly what it is about him that's special. But of course, the big mysterious thing here in this scene was Melisandre saying, I'm going over to Volantis, and Varys basically says, don't come back, it's not safe for you here, as in, get the hell out of here, I don't want to see you again because I hate red priests. But Melisandre says, I have to come back here, I have to die in this foreign land just like you. So apparently she has seen her own death in the flames at some point, and possibly Varys as well. So that kind of shook Varys up once again, so he doesn't know what's coming and when it's coming, although she likely knows and she could possibly tell him, although I don't know if I'd wanna know what the hell she knows if she actually saw something in the flames. But it also makes me wonder if she saw her own death when she saw Arya for the first time. She did say we will meet again, so we will see Melisandre again, whether it's in season seven, I don't really know. But the point being here that she could have seen her own death via the hands of Arya somehow, Although we'll see how Arya's story arc goes as far as getting back to Winterfell, becoming part of her wolf pack again, or is she going to still remain killing people on her damn list? Which includes Melisandre. We did have a quick scene with Theon getting rescued by other Ironborn. Apparently some did escape, as they mentioned on Dragonstone. And you feel fucking horrible for Theon again. You know, he had a reek moment, but he obviously made the right decision. Otherwise, he would have died right there as well as Yara. So you continue to feel bad for Theon. Like, when is this guy going to catch a fucking break? But if you've watched my episode 4 preview video, you know that Theon is now going to head back to Dragonstone. And of course, Jon is waiting there too. He's going to meet up with him there, likely. And Jon's not going to be too pleased because Theon did betray Rob. And of course, he ended up dying. So Jon's not going to be too happy when Theon shows up. So he's got more pain coming. We go to King's Landing with Psychopath Euron parading his gifts through the streets to take him to Cersei Lannister. And of course, that is going to be Elaria and Tyene Sand, as well as Yara Greyjoy, although he took Yara back with him. So apparently that's his prize. And she was fucking thrilled with this. She was thrilled with Euron. Killing and torturing people now actually turns her on. And promised Euron right there in front of Jaime that after the war is won, he would get what his heart desires. And of course, I don't think that's ever going to happen. But she was definitely turned on by this. And of course, Euron continues his roasting of Jaime right there in front of everybody. And he basically says, hey, I need your advice when we have a chance to talk man to man, you know. Does she like it gentle? Does she like it rough? And of course, the line of the damn episode how about a finger in the bum hole? So again, I'm really, really digging Euron Greyjoy as a villain this year, along with Cersei. They make the perfect duo as far as super villains now, and he's always got that fucking smile on his face. The next thing we saw Cersei take Tyene and Alaria down to the Black Cells, apparently, and actually poison her the same way that Marcella was poisoned. I thought that was a bit poetic. She went through her whole diatribe about how she wanted to kill her and she dreamed about killing her in several different ways, but she did it in a pretty damn bad way because she gave her the kiss of death with the same exact poison, the long farewell, and she's going to keep Alaria alive to watch her not only die, but apparently rot. She said she would be left alive long enough to watch her turn into skull and bones and ash and all that good stuff, and if they have to, they'll force food down her throat. So Cersei is completely devious here, she's completely mad, and she gets off on this shit. And we see that because the next scene, after she does all this, she goes upstairs and starts to blow Jamie immediately. And you know she still had poison on her damn lips. She just wiped it off with a shitty little rag and drank some antidote, and then goes straight upstairs to Jamie. But she is now openly sleeping with Jamie. He's still there for whatever reason, and somebody walks in, of course, and she says, I'm the queen of the seven kingdoms. Jamie tried to say, don't answer the door. And she says, fuck it, I'm the queen. I'm gonna do what the hell I want opens the door, and of course the handmaiden or whoever in the hill it was, was all nosy peeking up in there and saw Jamie in the bed. So she is not hiding it anymore. She doesn't care. She is the queen now, supposedly. She's going to do what the hell she wants. Then we cut to a scene with Tycho from the Iron Bank showing up and basically demands his debt from Cersei and essentially tries to warn Cersei that, look, we have a lady over here with three fucking dragons. How do Euron's wooden ships do against fire-breathing dragons? And Cersei, being so much like Tywin Lannister, like she's always wanted to be, she always thought, at least in the books, that she was the female version of Tywin, basically talks Tycho into staying as her honored guest for just a fortnight, which is two weeks, so she can go get the damn gold she needs from Highgarden, and they made it a point this episode to show that gold during the Highgarden battle, as a matter of fact, and we'll see if that works out for Cersei, but I don't think that's going to work out so well. Every plan she has ever made always comes crashing down in some way, shape, or form, and this time it's going to be the debt to the Iron Bank, because Danny is tired of losing. She's losing pretty badly at this point, and she's going to bring out the big guns, and we're going to finally see some dragon fire. And then we get another good John and Tyrion dialogue scene where they get to talk alone for a little bit. Ends up Tyrion actually believes him. He knows John is a trustworthy guy. He knows he's not making shit up, and he brings back the old callback again about Grumpkin and Snarks. They remember every line from every episode from every script, 
in season one when Tyrion was at the wall with Jon. But Tyrion basically tells him, I believe you, but you need to understand who Danny is. She did a lot of things she didn't have to do. She could have came here a long time ago, but she stayed where she was and freed a lot of damn people. So that made John understand Danny a little bit better. And it also gave John the opportunity to ask Tyrion what he could do to help. And of course, that is going to be Dragonglass. And I really dug the line here that Tyrion said to John, she protects people from monsters just like you. And that is true in a sense. So this is setting up their relationship. John is learning that he's just like Danny in different ways. And Danny's also learning the same thing, that they have these parallels with each other, although they come from different perspectives. They basically believe in the same damn thing. So ultimately already in this first episode, they certainly respect each other and I think a little bit more. We then see a little meeting between Tyrion and Danny, and of course they have now agreed to let Jon mine the Dragonglass. Tyrion is basically advising her, look, give him something, even if it's not true, it doesn't mean anything, it's just Dragonglass, let him take it, it's at least it's a step in the right direction as forming an alliance, because they do need an alliance either way they go. But Danny actually brings up the line that Davos said during their initial conversation in the throne room, where Davos had said he took a knife to the heart, so Danny remembered that, and Tyrion basically says he thinks that Davos was exaggerating a bit, but basically what that's going to do is set up a scene later on where I think Danny actually says, let me see those scars, if you know what I mean. And not only that, it also brings up the importance of John as far as her finding out that he actually came back to life and there is something bigger going on here. So it's going to help develop that story as far as what she does to help fight for the war for the dawn. And we have our first meeting with John and Danny alone without anybody else around. She's out there on the damn balcony somewhere contemplating life and John walks down to speak to her and she does say, I'll let you mine the dragon glass, take what you need. If you need any resources or men, I'll let you have them. And John says, thank you very much. So you believe me then. And she responds, you better get to work, Jon Snow. As in, I don't really believe you quite yet, but there's something about you. I'm not really sure. I don't think you're lying either, but go do what you have to do. And then he walks off and she gives him the old over the shoulder look. So she knows she's digging him. But the important part of this scene here was the callbacks to season five about Rhaegar. They really did a good job as far as these little loose ends and conversation and these callbacks to previous seasons. And she said something to the effect that we all enjoy what we do. And he said, I don't. And that was a direct reference to Rhaegar Targaryen. If you recall back in season five, Barristan Selma was telling Danny all about Rhaegar and how he was, how he enjoyed singing. He hated killing. He wasn't a killer. He was a nice guy that people actually loved. And when John said, I don't, that actually rung a bell with Danny. She thought back to that moment and she recognized Rhaegar and John in a way. And of course, that is a direct reference to John being Rhaegar's son. But from her perspective, it's kind of odd to her because she reminds him of Rhaegar, all the good things she's heard about Rhaegar from various people, mainly Barristan Selmy. So I love that they're doing all these callbacks this episode to previous seasons and previous sets of dialogues that at the time seemed kind of important but may not have been. But they're tying up all these little loose ends with dialogue and I love all the callbacks. And she's picking up on all this little stuff that's kind of seeming odd to her. And that's pointing to RLJ, of course, and a direct reference to Rhaegar Targaryen. But you know when he walked away and she was like, she's already kind of digging, you know, the king in the north. So we cut over to a scene in Winterfell with Sansa being in charge for the first time. And I gotta say, Sansa's doing a really good job. She's paying attention to detail. She's thinking about the bigger picture here. She was talking about the grain and how much food they needed as far as people to survive. She was talking about the other houses needing to bring it now versus when they actually have to run to Winterfell in case everybody has to fall back there. She even walks by and sees the detail of armor that's missing as far as boiled leather being on this armor and gets Royce to correct that. So she's going through all this stuff. And I'm thinking, okay, she's doing a damn good job here. And Littlefinger, of course, reminds her of this and says, you know, you're pretty damn good at this ruling thing, just like she told John before. So of course that's there to kind of undermine John a little bit as well. And then he starts having this conversation about fight all these battles in your damn mind. That way nothing's ever a surprise. And it looked at me for a moment, she was actually kind of listening to him again. Whereas before she's been kind of brushing him off. But then of course, during the middle of this conversation, there's a knock at the door. The doorbell rings at Winterfell and it's fucking Bran Stark and Mira Reed. And this scene was very, very odd to me, I gotta say. I understand Bran has seen a lot and been through a lot. He's seen a lot of death and destruction in the past. He's seen a lot of truths. He's seen Jon Snow's birth, etc. We have to assume he's seen all the bad shit that happened to his family. But this is really an emo Bran. He was sitting there and barely showed any emotion whatsoever. Sansa was actually happy to see him and ran over crying and hugged him. And Bran didn't even hug her back. And then later on, they're at the Godswood at Winterfell where Bran and Sansa are having a little conversation amongst themselves. And Bran's trying to explain things to her about him being the Three-Eyed Raven, and she's trying to understand what the hell he's talking about. He says it's too damn hard to explain, and I'm thinking, 
No, it's not. It's not really that fucking hard to explain. Explain that you went north of the wall, you found an old man in a tree, and you took his damn place, and now you can see all this shit through the weirwood trees. It's really that simple, Bran. At least just tell her that, and show some fucking emotion. Again, I understand he's been through a lot, he's seen a lot of shit, he's seen a lot of doom, he may have seen the future, maybe he's seen his own death, I have no idea, he says he can't be lord of anything, but damn, have some kind of empathy for your sister there, it's your fucking sister. But he does bring up that he saw Sansa at her wedding with Ramsay Bolton, he does say, I'm sorry for what happened to you, I saw how beautiful you were in your wedding dress that night, and she says, okay, I'm done, I gotta get the fuck out of here, I'm going to fuck back inside where it's warm. And Bran says, I'll stay a little while longer. Yeah, of course you will, because you can't fucking walk. And then we head to Old Town, and we see Jorah Mormont is now cured. Apparently, this has only been about a day. The other scenes, a lot of time has passed between scenes and between episodes, of course. But Jorah was only given one more day by Archmaster Ebros. So apparently, the next day after the surgery, he's basically healed up. His skin looks pretty damn decent as compared to what it did look like and he's actually let go. So although I didn't like the fact that they healed him that fast because he basically just had one night to get over this shit, he did have a good conversation with Sam, and the important part here was he was going to head back to his Khaleesi now, so he's going to be heading to Dragonstone, and he got to shake Sam's hand, and that was not a big deal in the sense of just shaking somebody's hand. He was telling him thank you, but the important part here was he had human touch for the first time since he got this damn disease back in season five when he kidnapped Tyrion and went through old Valyria. So he got to actually touch somebody, shake their hand, and really mean it, and that meant a lot to him. So Jorah is back, and he certainly will be, again, I think, a key advisor to Danny in helping her win this damn war against Cersei, which ultimately is going to turn into War for the Dawn, because after all, she's going to learn that that's not important over there, what's going on in King's Landing, but what's important is what's coming north of the Wall. And in return for curing Grayscale, Sam did not get kicked out of the Citadel. I kind of expected him to get kicked out of the Citadel because we did see those scenes early on where he's going to be leaving pretty soon. I don't think you'll have time to become a maester, but Archmaester Ebros actually makes him copy a bunch of old damn scrolls, and that's his reward slash punishment. Now the question is, is he going to find something important in those scrolls? A lot of people had reached out today on social media and in the live stream last night saying, what if he finds something about Rhaegar or Jon parentage in those scrolls. To that I would say I don't think so only because if they're old enough to be copied they're probably not going to be related to John's birth because John is only about 17, 18 years old in the show but the point being that any record of his birth or whatever even if it is at the Citadel would not be that old and in need of being copied. So if he does find something in those scrolls that he's copying I would think it's going to be related to the Long Night because that would be more like ancient documents whereas John's birth would be a fairly recent event. And then we head back to Castle Rock and Tyrion is giving his voiceover of the battle while we see it. I thought this was pretty cool Instead of seeing the whole damn battle drag out, we hear Tyrion kind of explaining what the hell's going on. He was put in charge of the drainage system, apparently, because he was too low for Tywin. And, of course, that gave the Unsullied their way in. And first off about this scene, I want to say that Casterly Rock looks like shit. I was expecting a lot more from Casterly fucking Rock. It looked horrible. It was a shithole looking castle on top of a mountain. Fucking cheap ass Lannisters. They certainly didn't put any of their gold to renovate their fucking castle. But according to Tyrion's plan, they take the Castle Rock fairly easily. They sneak in through the drainage system to get in and let the rest of the Unsullied in. The attack on the wall was basically just a diversion. But the point being here that most of the Lannister soldiers were not there whatsoever because they were all going to Highgarden, which they didn't know about. And this was the move for Cersei to get her damn gold. But the big surprise here to me was Euron showed up and burnt their fucking ships. So although the Unsullied got in and got the castle fairly easily as far as the battle goes, Euron showed up from around the whole fucking continent and now burned that part of the fleet. So Danny has now lost a major portion of her fleet. Not all of it. They did mention that it's a big portion of it. So she does have some ships left and I'm sure some Unsullied in other places and definitely Dothraki we'll see next episode. But this was taken fairly easily because they did not know about the move to take Highgarden. And Danny was already talking about this episode, she needed to go destroy Euron's fleet, and she definitely needs to do that. They were saying it was too dangerous because she could get killed off the back of Drogon, but she's going to turn around next episode and bring the damn pain. But what I really loved about this scene is we had another callback line from season one when Tyrion is telling this story about how Castle Rock is impregnable. He says, a good friend once told me, give me 10 good men and I'll impregnate the bitch. And of course, that was talking about Bronn. We have not seen Bronn except for one little scene this season. And that was another callback line to season one when Bronn and Tyrion are heading to the Eyrie where he was charged with trying to assassinate Bran. And of course, he had his first trial by combat when Bronn stepped up, killed that dude and knocked him out the fucking moon door. And then in our final scene, we see the Lannisters actually marching to Highgarden. We see the cut over here as Tyrion's telling his story where the Lannister army really is after Grey Worm discovers something's wrong, there's not enough men there, 
We cut over to High Garden and they are marching on High Garden and they basically just skipped the whole damn battle. They just showed Jamie walking through various parts of High Garden with all the bodies laying around once it was over. But then he goes in and meets Lady Olana Tyrell, the Queen of Thorns, and she is about to say her final goodbyes. So Jamie had apparently talked Cersei out of horrible ways to kill her and instead offered her some kind of painless poison. But the point of this whole entire conversation between Lady Olana and Jamie was to make Jamie start to think more and more about how fucking crazy Cersei is. She had basically said that she would do anything to protect her family, but some of the things that Cersei had done, she couldn't even fathom, which makes Jamie start to question what the hell's going on and what he's still doing at Cersei's side. But she did go out like a fucking champ. Once Jamie told her there wouldn't be any pain, she chugged that fucking glass, and then she does a mic drop before she dies and tells Jamie that she's the one who actually killed Joffrey. She did not implicate Littlefinger here because I don't think there's really a point to. She likely doesn't know where he's at or what's going on. And I'm glad they didn't show her death on screen. I didn't want to see her like fall over out of the chair or whatever, her head drop down to the table. She went out like a champ. She did a mic drop and he left her there to die and we didn't see it. So RIP Lady Olena Tyrell, the Queen of Thorns, one of my favorite all time characters in Game of Thrones and A Song of Ice and Fire. Your wit will never be forgotten. So anyway guys, that's all I have for Season 7, Episode 3, The Queen's Justice. Only four more episodes to go and this whole damn thing is over again. I think it was one of my favorite episodes of all time actually, not just because Danny and John met. I mean, that was a big part of it to finally see them two meet and realize they are very similar as far as people and their backgrounds just from different perspectives. I really loved all the callback lines and all the little loose ends as far as subplots and storylines they brought in from previous seasons, how they tied everything in with Rhaegar and John how they made Danny recognize that, and all the various callback lines to other characters in previous seasons. I thought it was done really, really well, and I thought it was done really, really well as far as the battle scenes. It shows you that you can have a great episode with battles in it and not actually see the fucking battle. Anyway, guys, let me know what you think in the comments below. How did you like episode three of The Queen's Justice? And as usual, thank you for all the support, especially to you guys on Patreon. And a huge shout out to my executive smokescreen producers, Paul Scriffin, Ball Guy 10, Lala Gig, Kisa Powell, Mark Joseph, aka The Snow and Winterfield, Marilyn Bentley, Joanna, Sean Hayes, Anonymous, Doc Holiday, Gosca, Hoon Jive, Kieran D20, Nikki Snow, Lo Horton, Aaron Habig, Ashley May, Ryan Solars, Dean Boyle, well, Carla Stark, John Kerry, and Anastasia. Thank you guys so much. I really appreciate the support. And to everybody out there on YouTube land, if you dig what I do here, please give this a like and a share. And be sure to join us every Sunday at 1030 Eastern Standard Time after the show for our live show. And we'll continue that throughout the rest of the season. And also be sure to subscribe to get everything and be sure to click that damn notification bell so you're notified when I drop a new damn video. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.